and we should be recording. So welcome everyone to the June 18th, 2018 IPFS All Hands Call. Uh, kicking off the agenda today, I would like to talk about some of the changes that we have been discussing recently, but uh, we're doing so without much of, much of the people here and without, um, without the recordings going up. Uh, the major problem we've been having is that nobody with permission is here. So while the meetings are going as planned, they're kind of hastily thrown together and we're spending a lot of time scrambling when I think that we could be a little bit more prepared and that can be achieved with some simple changes just like posting the agenda ahead of time and assigning the moderator ahead of time and things like that and having a contingency plan for when people are going to be away um, is basically all we really need to do but uh, I'm going to post it in the chat here the current proposal and uh, I would like everyone here to at least look at that and, and give your feedback on it so that um, we can change the meeting to be uh, a little bit more, just be a little bit more prepared for these meetings. Um, oh, Rob already posted it. <laughs> nice. So the typically we would pick a note, pick, note taker already, but the problem we're having is that the bot is down and we don't seem to have an up-to-date list of who is willing to volunteer for that. So I figure we should probably get that out of the way before we do anything else. Um, if you would like to be a note taker, I guess for now post a maybe a reply in the chat or in the GitHub issue for the all hands call for today, um, which will be, let's see here, this one here. Oh, there it is. I posted the same one, I think. No, never mind. Sorry. I'm a little out of it today, a little hot over here. So we, we need to build that list of note takers so that we don't spend a good five minutes or however long this has taken to, to set up for the meetings. We spend too much time preparing for that before we even get off the ground recording. So if you just would do that, that'd be great. Um, but for now, we'll just have to do it the old fashioned way of um, someone, if you would like to take notes today, please raise your hand. Jacob, you're first. That'd be perfect. And we can just put those in the Google Docs for now. So with all that out of the way, let's actually get on with business as usual. Uh, for the agenda today, it looks like we have uh, Juan with the Twitter pin bot. Uh, take it away, Juan. Hector. Sorry about that, Hector. Hello. I don't know how good my connection is. Um, very short, very shortly, here's what it says on the Google Doc. I did a pin bot and I had some free time. And if you want to use it to pin, it's just like the IRC pin bot or almost, except that you just mentioned the Twitter pin, but on Twitter with a CID and a description, and it will pin things for you on the storage faster. Any questions? Rob? Lars. Um, is that like IRC in that not anybody can just pin and how can people get on the privileged list of pinners, if so? In order to get on the privileged list, the Twitter bot needs to follow you. So if it's you, then you can pin. Otherwise, you cannot. Lars, did you have a question? Uh, can you hear me? I just set up uh, my microphone. Yeah, great. Um, e, the notes say uh, that IPNS name resolve is supported yet. Do you mean not supported yet? Not supported yet. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Lars again. <laughs> <laughs> How can I get it to follow me? 
uh, uh, mention it on Twitter or mention me or send me okay, your great. Twitter handle or something. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, that's really exciting. I like that we are having more options for people to um, pin things other than just IRC or manually. Um, do we have any other demos today? Two more? Oh, I'm sorry, they've been moved down here. Um, B5 on update queer? Query, query, or QRI, whatever you prefer. <laughs> yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Cool, yeah, I just wanna take a quick second to give everybody an update on some of the stuff we've been working on. Um, just, it's fun to share on this call because it's uh, it builds heavily on libp2p and IPFS. Um, but to give a little bit of background, uh, we come a lot from the, I built this startup around the data rescue movement when we first got started. And uh, uh, the update that I'm excited to give is I think we finally sort of walked a full circle around how to answer a lot of the questions that we were sort of dealing with um, a year and a half ago. <laughs> um, some people on the call are laughing because they were in those rooms while that was happening. And uh, at the time we sort of, for those of you who didn't know, we had data rescues were like these loosely coordinated groups of people attempting to build something that looked a lot like a data commons um, uh, by archiving government data. And so we had like librarians, academics, data scientists, and programmers in the same room, uh, but we felt a real lack of tooling. And uh, that's actually where I met Matt Zumwalt, and we had like a good conversation about how IPFS could contribute to the conversation and how uh, lib P2P and the notion of peer-to-peer -peer distributed systems and content addressing might help some of this. And so if you don't mind, I'll take kind of five minutes uh, at most and just update you on sort of some of the things we've brought into the mix on query. Uh, if you guys don't mind, I'll share my screen now. That kind of good. Cool. Hopefully this works. Um, okay. Uh, does everybody see an editor here? Yep. All right, yep. cool. Thumbs up. Awesome. Uh, so I uh, agree. We've been focusing on bringing a lot of the best bits that we could find from those days. Um, back in the day, we had uh, librarians contributing the notion of uh, what a good metadata spec looked like. Um, we had computer scientists uh, contributing how to structure data sets and how to work with data sets. Um, and then we had a lot of data scientists coming in, uh, coming in and writing these uh, wonderful sort of Python-based scripts that were helping ingest and transform data into make them repeatable and audible. And so what we've been trying to build for a long time is this sort of uh, contribute a standard definition of what a data set is and uh, uh, couple that with a lot of uh, a sort of section for every audience that sort of helps contribute during that time. And so the biggest thing we've landed that I wanted to show today is this uh, notion of transformations that we've landed. Uh, we've implemented the Skylark programming syntax, which comes from the Google Bazel project. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Uh, what Skylark is, is it's a Turing incomplete subset of Python, so it looks a lot like Python. Uh, and what we're using this for in this context is to automate a repeatable uh, script that generates a data set. And so in this case, what we're doing is this data set uh, generates a list of, uh, uh, what does this do? Um, it's been a minute, I've been demoing a lot this week. Uh, this checks for contributors um, and actually runs this, and we sort of defined, it's gonna grab a bunch of contributors to a, a repo from GitHub. Um, and so we won't go through this code at, at nauseum, but the most important stuff to call out here is we have this function called transform and this function called download. And both of these sort of are things that we're going to embed into the execution of a data set that will generate something on IPFS. And so I'm going to uh, use a, so in this context, I have two special environment variables set that will make a lot of sense to this community. Uh, we have IPFS path set properly, and then we also have query path set um, to something that we would like it to go to. Uh, so if I do, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run query add, and I'm going to supply a couple of things here just to quickly walk through this. Uh, this dataset.yaml file is the file I was just showing you here, which defines some basic sort of structure. This is our standard definition of a data set. And so we have a section which is mainly uh, drives a lot of its knowledge from library science. It's structure which defines a machine readable structure of stuff. And then this transform script is the most important part. Uh, so this is a link to that transform.sky file. And then we configure it to say, hey, I want to grab from the, Go, from the IPFS Go organization and the Go IPFS repo. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this query add function providing it this dataset.yaml file. And while this is a public endpoint, I just thought it would be good to demo that we can actually plumb secrets into this. And so in this case, we're plumbing in a GitHub API token. 
And so it's going to warn me and say, hey, I'm, uh, an API token to a script that someone else has written. This is probably something you want to check before you actually run this. But I'm going to say yes, because I wrote it. So I think it's, I think it's safe. Uh, we're going to run it. It's going to go on the internet. And it's going to create a new data set. And so now if I do query ls, we can see this uh, go IPFS contributors by week. Um, and what this has done is this has generated hash on, on uh, IPFS. All this data is being stored on IPFS. And so if I do query uh, use, I'm going to select this thing. And I'll do query get. You can sort of see. I'll let's do the form. It's a little nicer. This is what actually got generated. And so what, what happened is we, we did a lot of things that in the background for you, we generated a commit with an author based on an ID that we provided for you. We signed that commit with a cryptographic hash of the signature, which is the checksum of the data that was generated. Uh, executable, so I can just run query update, and it'll go and rerun that script, that transformation that has now been embedded inside of this data set. Um, just to make this a little more visible, I can finally run query render, which will uh, just execute templates against data sets. And so, Hit that, of course, error, but I've already loaded this, so it's not that big a deal. Um, and it gives you a chart that looks something like this. Uh, uh, I think I went through that a little, but basically what happened is I I've pre-written some HTML that takes a query data set and turns that into this chart. And so if you know how to write, this is very similar to like your world of like static site rendering templates or anything like that. Um, but we sort of, in the world of query, we think that data is sort of our fundamental unit that makes things possible so we can do uh, uh, all kinds of stuff like query diff and query validate and query log, which will oh, actually do query log, that thing. Oh, no, whatever. Anyways, uh, and then last but not least in the stuff that's more interesting to those of us in the libp2p world, I can run query connect, which will um, spin up an IPFS node. And then on top of that, it will uh, add uh, the query sort of like overlay network on top of an overlay network concept it gives me my so my profile ID is actually separate from my IPFS uh, pure ID address and then I can sort of just quickly get a feel for this I can do query peers list and this will show query peers that I've connected to but again for this crowd I can do network equals IPFS and this will show all the IPFS peers that I'm currently connected to currently we're debugging the way that uh, connection manager um, prioritizes peers and so I can We'll see a few peer, a few more peers appear in this as the network finds more people and hydrates. But um, all of this, at the end of the day, is uh, query is designed to put data sets on IPFS and make them interoperable with ways that work and are functional. And last but not least, we've done all of this as a front end. So if I reload this, we can sort of see um, this connecting and showing my actual data sets. And so this is the data set we just generated. Uh, this is the actual information that was being loaded. Here's the structure that was determined. And the metadata that we have. Um, so yeah, and then if I need to, I can sort of see the person I'm connected to. Oh, that's me. Sorry. This is the person I'm connected to. I can grab their data sets. I can move over to them. If this peer had a data set, I could just hit add, and that pins it to my local IPFS node. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at with query. It's uh, taken us a long time to get to this place, but we finally feel like we figured out some important problems. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions, but all of this is downloadable enough right now on our thing. We got to cut a release, but hey, Matt, what's up? Go ahead, Matt. In the patent, Brendan, this is great. I, I'm so happy to see this stuff coming along and landing. In the past, you worked on having query no the query nodes that are sitting on top of IPFS nodes also be, they were also indexing content so that you could query it on the fly. Are you still doing that or did you set that aside? So we intend to, uh, yeah, for a long time, for those of us, for those of you who maybe aren't on the total background of me haunting these calls, um, we had like SQL nodes built on, or an SQL selection engine built on top of this. Uh, we're intending to go back there, um, but we first want to get, we needed, we realized we needed to get our fundamentals right first. Um, and so what we're really excited about with the Skylark implementation is it actually sets us up for uh, distributed computing as well, uh, because Skylark is a massively parallelizable language. Unlike Python, it has a global interpreter lock. And so we could, there's nothing stopping us from writing something called map and reduce that can then be called by query peers. And you could create a sort of on the fly swarm of people to do compute. Um, we're very excited about like the notion of semantic chunking. So getting right down into IPFS blocks and making them line up with query rows so that you could say, hey, go take these 100 rows and go do this thing to them. Um, so we think there's some really exciting possibilities that come out of that. Matt again. Have you, I'm excited to see commit graphs 
implemented in query, have you dealt with any of the like allowing multiple people to author commits and merge those changes? So like Matt and Lars and Michelle are all editing, are all editing and modifying, and we want to be able to merge Michelle's changes or allow allow her to push her changes into the repo. Any of that like sprawling uh, access controls consideration. <laughs> Yes, we've uh, we we have started to roadmap. We're calling them change requests because we're not very original. But uh, yeah, we don't we don't quite know how that'll work. But we have definitely laid all the foundations for making that work properly. Um, the biggest thing is obviously like getting the sort of signing of hashes is removing and knowing who's authoring what. Um, currently, Brave, when you can add each other's data sets, they just stay authored as that current person. Uh, the recommended workflow while we work on these change requests is just you can use query export to spit out any data set as it currently exists and say, cool, that's somebody else's transform script. I'll just rerun it as my own and create my own data set. Uh, eventually, we'll figure out some way to merge them back together. But uh, well, for would, now, there, you would it be possible, like, if I just, Michelle's made like 20 changes to the data set, could I pull that with its commit history and then make my own changes? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, but it would become yours. Like as, as soon as you started making changes to Michelle's data set, I would it would become uh, it would be associated with your profile. Uh, in the and, future, we need. But I, you would still see her commits in the history before yes. I started modifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It would show um, because we embed the pure ID author into the actual one that you're building upon. So you can reference just like a normal sort of commit chain. You can reference previous commits that aren't of your own making. Rob. Um, is the is the script or like the hash of the script included um, in the in the commit so that there's some sort of signature that kind of covers the how the data was generated? Absolutely. So the script itself rides with the data set definition. So when you do query add, it comes with it. We think that's what makes them repeatable and usable. So you could take the thing that I just wrote, configure it, and set it up for I don't know, say JS IPFS, and you could run that exact same script to generate a different data set. Um, the scripts themselves, I should m mention that uh, the Skylark syntax that we've implemented uh, explicitly denies access to things like the file system and like, you know, there's some basic security stuff that you can't do <laughs> for obvious reasons. We've also gone to like great lengths to make that download step it's one that uh, has access to the internet and we've, we've uh, turned off all the access to the actual like underlying what's on IPFS or whatever and then you have to hand back the data. And then you can do more interesting stuff in the transform stuff. But um, we sort of explicitly try to have a nice security model for that. But we also really want, because we want the scripts to travel with the data sets and make them this something that you could take and sort of build upon as you go, move forward. Yeah. Anyways, we're excited to start seeding this stuff with some real content. We have some really interesting things coming forward. I'm excited really to connect with you, Hector, especially because we're going to have to, the next thing we have to build is some service to pin massive sets of these data sets to keep them available. Um, but uh, we, we're really pumped about the libp 2 p technology and IPFS underlying technology. This has been a really fun experience to try and build something that'll hopefully facilitate building a data commons for people who are interested and excited for such a thing. Anyways, yeah, uh, Rob. Sorry, um, I just wanted to confirm it sounded like you said there's not a release that includes this yet, but you should be cutting it soon. So yeah, we'll cut it this afternoon. Yeah, and so the the transformation is all in it right now, but we just have some cleanup. Like I showed query use and query get today, which we'll ship this afternoon. Uh, the PRs are all there. If you pull tip right now and, and start building, it, knock yourself out. We would be deeply appreciative, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, our GitHub repo is our org is dash query query dash io qri dash io. Um, any comments, suggestions, super welcome. Uh, we've we've isolated the P2P folder explicitly to make it a little more fun to talk about P2P conversations in one place. But um, yeah. Thanks again, guys. It's great to be part of this peering community. Fantastic. Um, I'm personally ex very excited over to see tools like this being made and, and released. It's fantastic. Um, so up next, it looks like we have a demo from Mache, if you would like to go ahead with that. Um, so it's less of a demo. It's more of a presentation because uh, it's just about rewriting the WebRTC uh, transport. So um, I have invented this thing called Interface Data Exchange, which basically abstracts away the logic of exchanging something like a handshake. And the motivation behind this is basically when the WebRTC uh, star server is down, the whole thing is down, 
And after all, this is called libplp and not HTTP, so it shouldn't crash the whole application. And so I thought, let's create interface data exchange. It's basically exchanging a single handshake or signaling or something like that uh, request through an abstracted away interface. And it has also many advantages over WebRTC star because it's not bound to a single server. And it's also not using socket IO, which apparently seems to be a good thing if it's a P2P transport. And um, so I've made two implementations. The first one is libp exchange direct, which uh, I'm going to show the tests or, um, as a demo. And uh, it basically uses the existing libp circuit connection to exchange this uh, um, SDP offer for WebRTC. And then there's also libp exchange rendezvous, which uh, is like, um, a share, uses a shared peer between two other peers to exchange uh, this SDP offer. And uh, it should not be confused with the other thing I made called Rendezvous Protocol. And so this is basically a graph of how it will, uh, how it will work. So this is the LPDP Exchange Direct module. There's already a connection of a LPDP circuit established. And through a node that both browsers are connected via WebSocket Secure. And then it simply exchanges this SDP offer and upgrades that connection over the Diami protocol, which is going to be implemented uh, soon. And it uh, has normal WebRTC connection without the need for the server anymore. And in the Rendezvous uh, module, it's uh, similar. There's the server and it runs the LPTP Exchange Rendezvous server module. The nodes are not connected over circuit and they don't need to actually connect. Um, Instead, uh, the first browser simply asks for the public key of the other peer, then sends the encrypted offer together with a signature, the server forwards that, and uh, the whole procedure goes back again, uh, the other side, and then a web RDC connection is established. And that's basically the point of uh, this rewrite. And in the future, uh, or basically later, I will try to integrate this better into the PDP. So it's uh, integrated in a similar way as Discovery is. Um, and uh, also a few features in the PDP need to get added, like um, supporting um, to pass the swarm as an argument to a transport and uh, merging this. And maybe in the future, the rendezvous point server can be enabled by default. And uh, to go with the PDP node trust, it can even get more decentralized. Also, I have a future idea to make like a shim that tries multiple exchanges like the direct and the rendezvous exchange based on the priority and uh, exchange also via DHT. And so uh, now I'm going to demo um, the tests, which uh, isn't actually quite a lot. It's just a bunch of block output. Um, eh. Maybe I should have tested that command. Uh, uh, finally. So what this really does is, um, oh gosh, my computer is so slow. <laughs> So this basically runs the tests. Um, this basically just shows that it works, that I already have a working solution and yeah, that will uh, take some 30 seconds because apparently um, WebRTC is very slow on this network for some reason. <laughs> so I'm sorry for taking forever. It's just that my setup is not the best. Um, so uh, what it did is first it connected to uh, the PDP circuit relay. Then it uh, connected those two peers of a circuit. 
and then um, it exchanged that signaling offer via the LIMPDP exchange protocol, I guess. It's more like an interface. So any module that implements the interface could be used for that. It's not strictly limited to Renewables protocol or the direct exchange, DHT and everything else is possible. And so, yeah, this basically shows that it works. And I don't think I need the other tests. They are just repeating the same thing. And that's the demo. Do you have any questions or, or something unclear? We have no questions on this. All right, well, thanks for the demo, Mache. It's uh, very exciting to see some of this, the interconnectivity with the peers in the browser. Uh, very happy to see all that stuff come together. Um, I'm going to just double check the agenda here and make sure we have nothing remaining. Otherwise, we, we skipped me at the beginning. Oh, sorry, Rob, go ahead. No um if there's nobody else uh so i just want to to quickly say because i know um some of the discussion there's been since we switched to using google docs a few weeks ago is that it's a pain to convert to markdown um so last week i spent a day where i tried a bunch of different converters none of them really worked really well so i wrote one um so there's a link in the notes uh it's pretty simple just copy paste from google docs drop it in the left hand side and it'll give you markdown on the right hand side that should be pretty reasonable um if you have issues with it uh feel free to file issues or submit prs it's really simplistic um but yeah so hopefully that helps people who are transfer transferring the notes from google docs to uh github and makes that not a huge problem anymore that's all thank you <laughs> that's really cool I have a question on that, Rob. Is there, um, I know Victor's not here, but do you have any idea if this can be integrated with our Notebot? Um, you could definitely take the parts of it and do something. Uh, I think the tough part would be you'd have to figure out how to write something to identify where like the current notes start and end because the Google Doc is like a running set of notes that includes history and a template down at the bottom. Um, so I figured it was the like easy, simple thing for now to just have whoever is transforming the notes just copy, paste, and manage it. But definitely the routine that does the transform is pretty well split out. Um, so you could definitely write something automated that did it too. That's perfect. I. Uh maybe we should continue the discussion on the proposal and see if we can do something to get the template down where it would maybe work better with this or decide if it should just be manual throughout. Sure. Okay, do we have anything else that I missed on this? I'm looking around, it looks like everything is good. So before we go, I just want to remind everyone that the agenda and such for next week is going to be posted in advance. I will probably post it in the PM issue or open up a PM issue for next week um, immediately following this. So if you'd like to schedule anything ahead of time, uh, you can do that right after we're done here. So with that out of the way, that concludes the meeting. Thank you all for coming and bearing with this. Bye-bye. <laughs>